This is episode 115 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome to episode 115 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today, I have Antoine Martel on the show. Antoine is another one of these mid-20s, full of energy, full of ambition type of guys uh, that's just hit the ground running and he's absolutely crushing it in the US market. So Antoine lives in California and he is investing in a few select cities in the uh, east side of the country, including St. Louis, including Cleveland, Ohio, including Detroit and uh, a couple of others as well in there. And what Antoine one is doing is he's actually going in he's finding properties he's finding teams and he's renovating properties and creating turnkey products in addition to building up his own portfolio as well only in his mid-20s and he's already been investing for five years so he had the real estate bug young and he turned it into a full-time occupation for himself so we dug in in this episode into the fundamentals of picking the right market uh, what to look for what to avoid what type of price points Antoine likes and which ones he doesn't um, tools that we can use to find low crime areas. Um, I thought it was a really interesting episode and ultimately I was just asking questions that were entirely relevant to my search right now because I'm also looking in the US market to buy housing. So I do think that you're going to get a lot out of this and with all the challenges going on in Canada right now, I personally feel that it's responsible to diversify a little bit and that is why I'm looking in the US. Before we get into the episode, if you could please just take a moment to rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you like, subscribe and hit the notification bell if you have not already done so. And uh, please leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. Let me know what your, uh, what your questions are and let me know what you'd like to hear more of. If you're new to this podcast and some of the language and terminology isn't familiar to you, I highly recommend you head right back to episode one where we dig really deep into the nuts and bolts. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into episode 115 with Antoine Martel. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I have Antoine Martel on the show and I'm hoping I said that right. You can correct me if I, uh, I messed that up, but uh, you're doing a lot of uh, turnkey rentals down here in the States and I thought it would be a super interesting conversation. I'm down in the States right now. I'm in Florida. So uh, I wanted to talk to you, get to know about what you're doing, what kind of opportunities you're seeing and uh, how you're winning in real estate. So Antoine, why don't you uh, just go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Of course. Awesome. And thank you so much for having me on the show today. Excited to be here. Um, my name is Antoine Martel. I live in California. I've been investing in real estate for five years now. I buy rehab rent and then resell about 10 to 15 houses a month uh we're doing that in a couple of different markets memphis tennessee cleveland ohio birmingham uh alabama is a place we used to do st louis and now we're looking at detroit so a couple of different markets um and we have a turnkey company like like you mentioned so we go buy these properties renovate them rent them out put a property management company in place then sell that property to our clients, help our clients get financing, insurance, mm -hmm. um, connect them with the property manager, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, some, most of our clients come in, buy these properties, put 20% down and, you know, are cash flowing from day one. So that's kind of the objective with the, the business model. How long have you been doing this? Five years. So I, mm -hmm. uh, I started, I went to like a real estate seminar in 2015 for that first year and a half, uh, two years, I was really just like testing and learning and networking and I was still in college. So I graduated college in 2017. So 2015 to 2017 studying after I went to that seminar, I kind of got addicted to, to real estate mm -hmm. and real estate investing. And then 2017, I bought that first house in Memphis, Tennessee from LA, from my dorm room. Really? Okay. So you just, you bought it right away. Um, was that a turnkey provider? Someone sold that to you? No. So we, I was actually talking to a couple of these turnkey providers and it was again, very new business to me. I had been like networking with a ton of people who were flipping houses in LA or across the country. And then I was like, okay, all right. How can my family get involved in this? I am graduating college. I want to get into real estate. Um, I don't really want to, mm -hmm. I want to have my own business is what my main goal was. And mm -hmm. I was like, all right, maybe real estate is the way to do that. And through flipping houses or doing something like that. And I, through networking with a ton of people, got connected with a couple of property management companies and turnkey providers. And then I started looking at the turnkey providers deals as a way for, you know, to retire my parents or to get my parents to, to quit their nine to five jobs. 
And I was like, man, if we, if we had a, a million dollars in cash, yeah, sure. We can probably get there eventually. Just the properties were way too expensive, like 150, 200,000 bucks for these turnkey rentals. And I was like, this is way too high of a price point. You know, my, my dad had 40 grand saved up that he wanted to invest. It was like, we can, we can buy one turnkey rental and make 200 bucks a month, but that's not going to get us anywhere. Um, so after looking at those turnkey providers product that they had, I went and did my own due diligence and found that I can do the same thing, maybe not in the same zip code, but in a similar zip code, I found a property management company, found a contractor, a uh, title company, all that kind of stuff and bought that first house in 2017, right? Like a couple months before graduating um, for 35 grand and then renovated it for five grand. And it was like rented out for 800 bucks a month or something crazy. Okay. 35 K for 800 bucks a month. Yeah. That's awesome. Now, did you yep. have, I mean, I invested in, in Youngstown, Ohio back in like 2012 and uh, it didn't go well for me, but did you have, um, hiccups along yeah. the way there? Like, how did you ensure that that first, that first move was a, was a feasible one was one that wasn't going to blow up in your face? Yeah. Yeah. Youngstown's interesting that, uh, I actually just watched a documentary about that place like, a uh, six months ago or so. <laughs> Oh my God. I didn't know it was that bad because it's pretty close to Cleveland. And so mm -hmm. I was thinking of expanding. We're looking at Akron, Ohio, and then Youngstown was another, another market we were looking into. But after mm -hmm. I watched that documentary, I don't know what your experience was, but man, it must've been hard. Um, yeah. Well, just, just there's rough neighborhoods, better neighborhoods, but I mean, it's, it's a rough town. Like I'm not going to pretend I haven't seen towns. Like we, we have like Hamilton and where I'm from, like yeah. in, in Canada is actually very yeah. similar. Like it's, it's a very yeah. rough town, but it's, it's been really getting better. So yeah. Yeah. yeah my grandma town. lives in, my grandma lives in London. So Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm London from, too. I'm, uh, well, I, I have all my, uh, my rental properties in London. So yeah, that's kind oh, of really? uh, my home base. No yeah. Way. yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah, cool. So the, the hiccups along the way are building teams. I've only really had a team completely fail one time. Um, and it was kind of like, I had bought that first house in Memphis, had a team there, they were doing well. And then I bought a couple more properties and then I was like, all right, let me see if I can expand. Let me go to a, a new market. I've done mm -hmm. whatever, three or four deals. I was like, it's time to add a new market, which was silly. Uh, so I went to Cleveland, Ohio, built a new market, built a new team there, like property manager, contractor, realtor, all of that. And did, you know, tested a house there, went well, started doing another one. And then like, this is all within a year and a half period or a year or so. And then I was like, all right, time to build a new market. I don't know again what I was thinking. And so I went to Akron and I built the whole team there. And mm -hmm. that was where things started to, to go south and you started seeing the red flags. You know, people are always so good on the phone, you know, when you're trying to build a team in a market like, hey, here's, I'm Antoine Martel. I'm trying to buy houses, renovate them, rent them out and sell them to my clients. Um, can you help me, you know, find properties, manage the, manage the renovations, fill the properties with tenants. Like let's build a relationship and build the business together, that kind of thing. And just a lot of them were, you know, we're talking a good game on the phone and then you'd finally get out there and go see the product they were doing. And the renovation was totally horrible or it was like double what you thought, you know, what they quoted you from the beginning um, or it just never got finished. They got the renovations up to like 90%. And mm -hmm. then, you know, they never did the last 10%. Didn't matter how much, they owed you. They were just like on to the next project. Like it almost got like boring for them to be at the house. Um, yeah. So yeah, a lot, a lot of things happen. And then also just like property management companies charging like fees here and there for like silly stuff, like to go out to the property every time that they had to go check up on something at the property, they'd charge me a trip fee of like $50 or something like that. And I'm like, this is part of the, like the renovation. This is part of like you guys being able to rent out the property. Why am I paying for your quality control person to go out two or three times because he forgot the lockbox code? Like that's not my mm -hmm. problem. I shouldn't be paying for that kind of thing. So that was the only time when, uh, when I've had real trouble, like building a team in a market was in Akron. <laughs> Do you, so is that your typical approach though? You would, you would focus on the property manager first and then say, where are you like, where do you have need for rentals? Can you help me find properties? Is that kind of what, what's worked well for you? Yeah. So when I first started, it was, I thought realtors were the main 
person to go talk to, uh, quickly realize that finding a great realtor that's willing to help you and do what you want is like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, so then I went with a different approach because also in any market you can find like, you know, there's probably 10,000 realtors in Memphis, Tennessee, right? So I can call 10,000 people or I can call the property management companies, which now is maybe 20 or 30. So I was like, well, I'd rather call 30 than 10,000 people. So I uh, started calling and said property management companies. And then, yeah, like you said, build that relationship with them, explain to them who I am, what I'm trying to do, and mm-hmm. kind of show them the light that, hey, you know, can you guys handle, you know, bringing on 10, 15 new clients every single month in your market? Can you guys handle um, X, Y, and Z? And so some property management companies are set up perfectly for us. Some of them we can go in and like literally give them advice or make changes to their property management companies to work with us better um, or have them hire people on their staff once we get things rolling and kind of show them the way of like scaling up their property management company alongside us. So yeah, it is a real like, uh, it is a real like business relationship that we do build like a partnership. I mean, with these people that we're building and, you know, we've been working with, like the Memphis and Cleveland guys for like five years or so now. And, you know, constantly like us three are talking with one another, one another and like Memphis and Cleveland teams are talking Mm -hmm. with one another as well to figure out like better ways to do things or processes or systems to implement and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Do you have uh, your own rental portfolio in these States now as well, or are you just selling to others? Yeah, we, we do keep some, uh, we have about a hundred units of apartments, in memphis tennessee so we had a single family home portfolio we sold a few of those like half of it we were left with like uh, i think five to ten houses and then we took the cash we got from that to buy some apartment buildings and then we started raising money for apartments so yeah we do we have a ton in a ton in memphis uh which was about 100 units of apartments and then in cleveland we have like five or six duplexes um, St. Louis, we had a, we had a four unit apartment building that we were holding and we sold that a couple months ago. Um, so yeah, there, there is some like creative deals that, you know, don't work for the turnkey client that we hold. Um, but also I'll say this, like every deal that we analyze to buy as a company is one that we are fine with holding. So for example, like our acquisition team goes, analyzes a deal. Hey, we want to have these three exit strategies. So we want to be able to sell it to one of our turnkey clients and make a, a good profit or a good return and also give the good return to the turnkey client. We want to be able to cash it out, do a cash out refinance and hold it long term. And we want to be able to just hold it, hold it cash for the long term. And are we happy with all three of those kind of returns for us as a company? Mm-hmm. And if the answer is yes, then that's a deal we move forward with. So we always have that, like, you know, a couple different exits for every house that we're buying. I always talk about that. The plan A, B, and C. I like three, uh, yeah. I, even, even two is sometimes a little suspect. I like, you know, yeah. I hate, I yeah. hate just having a plan A. That's kind of how I went into, uh, into uh, Youngstown. And that's a big part, part of why it didn't work out. Cause I didn't yeah. have a good plan B or C. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And that's why I like this learning. price point too. Yeah. That's why I like this price point too. Like the the 60 to the 150 price range, because you have more options now, like, I'm scared for the guys that are like flipping houses at the 250, 350 range. Mm-hmm. And like they have one exit, like they can't, you can't even hold the thing and rent it out because you it doesn't make any. Flow, right? Yeah. yeah. So like yeah. I'm worried for those guys. And I know a couple of them are in like Houston, Texas, and they're, you know, preaching, you know, just posting everywhere that they're making all this money on flipping. And I'm just like, wait till the tide turns, buddy, because you're going to be left with 75 houses yeah. that nobody wants to buy. So that's the thing that's always tricky for me to flip something. Cause if I'm going to flip it, I need to like it to keep that's because yeah. What do you do? If, if all of a sudden the market corrects, you don't have, if you don't have a cash flow position on rent, then you're, yeah. then you're really going to kind of hate your life a little bit. So yep. uh, yeah, that's, 100%. <laughs> that's not a great place to be um, or you're going to disappoint a lot of investors. There's going to be a lot of, a lot of things that go wrong there that, that are going to be no fun. Yeah. Where, where do you see, cause obviously it, it changes. You'll, I'll hear, you know, someone say that, you know, Memphis is good. And then all of a sudden now they're changing their, their tune and they think a different town is good. So what towns do you see as being really ideal right now as, as like a great opportunity? Yeah. So I really like, uh, Memphis, Tennessee is really hot. Like we, you know, it's even hard for us to buy inventory. So we're submitting like probably, I don't know, this morning I wrote, I sent like five contracts out. 
So we're, we're doing everything that we can in order to find inventory. It's just really hard and really hot. And the values are going through the roof, which, you know, is good for some people and it's bad for, for, you know, for certain investors, that'd be a great time to get in. Right. Because they're going to say, Oh, the appreciation, you know, there's so much appreciation or whatever, but I'm always thinking like, um, you know, when, when stuff is way too hot and it's on everybody's radar, that's the time to get out. And so that's why we started yeah. selling, you know, our apartment buildings. We sold one last month. We sold actually two weeks ago, we sold one last month and we just been selling this stuff because, you know, we've gotten offers that are, you know, crazy in our opinion, like offers that, uh, that we didn't think we would be able to get and we got them. And that's why we're, we sold them, even though I told people I was going to hold it forever. Um, so I don't know the, the top markets that we're investing in right now are Memphis, Tennessee, and Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Memphis is way, way hotter than, not way hotter, but it's hotter than Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, Ohio, we're still able to get a ton of inventory. It's still a great market, still a ton of appreciation, and the cash flows are still good so far. Um, but Memphis, Tennessee is blowing, you know, bursting from the seams. And uh, it seems like there's a ton more investors just like trying to get into that market right now, which for me, uh, means it's time to look somewhere else. Kind of like what I mentioned. Yeah. So you're starting to always turn and I did the same because like Ontario as a whole has just gone insane at oh, home. Yeah. So, so a lot of guys I know are starting to look out of province. I'm like, I'm going to start looking at a country because I, I like yeah. the political hedge. I like to be in an entirely different jurisdiction from a government standpoint, uh, you know, just in case something happens that I don't like. Um, yeah. So I'm definitely interested in, in, you know, kind of keeping an open mind as to what markets I invest in. Yeah. Now, what do you look for when you're picking a market? Like what are your key criteria? Yeah. So <laughs> population growth, or at least a stable population. Um, Does Cleveland satisfy that? Cause I looked at Cleveland. I thought it was uh, negative growth. So Cleveland's been a negative growth and that's the one that had a negative growth. And so then if you dive deeper into that, cause a lot of people just probably look at the chart you know, which shows a negative growth for the last like 30 to 40 years. Um, the reason why the population has been decreasing in Cleveland, Ohio is because they used to have a big steel industry, right? So in the sixties and seventies, all the steel was made in Cleveland, Ohio. And so they had all these big steel warehouses and, and stuff like that manufacturing. And then since then the sixties and seventies, when all the steel went away and left Cleveland, Ohio, whether it went to, you know, China or out of country, um, they started just importing it instead the population started leaving and going to places like where you are now, like in Florida and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it was an older generation that started leaving. So if you actually look at the, the population changes by age group for Cleveland, Ohio, the older population is leaving, leaving Cleveland, Ohio, but there's actually a younger, an uptick in the younger generation that is entering Cleveland, Ohio. And you can see that not just on paper and on the grass, but also when you go to Cleveland, Ohio, you can see like, there's a ton of neighborhoods that are up and coming or hipster with the coffee shops and the yoga studios and the pizza place and all that kind of stuff. And so that's what I noticed when I went to Cleveland, Ohio <clears throat> and started touring around the city and stuff like that. So that's, that's one market that's a little bit different where it doesn't really satisfy that requirement, but in general, population growth, uh, job growth, looking at the major employers to see who the major employers are. Do I think that they're companies that are going to be around for the long term? Um, and then diving deeper into like the actual city. So like um, which zip codes to invest in. So we like to be in zip codes that have no crime that are close to jobs um, and uh, low crime, close to jobs. And then normally like a 15 to 20 minute, drive from downtown. So I like being close to that downtown core um, and no crime areas. I don't really care much about like schools or school ratings or school systems because normally that just like artificially pushes up the prices and then now it's like, you know, in the $200,000 range. Oh, okay. So you're actually specifically just not paying attention because you think those are propped up values and you prefer the, uh, the lower yeah. values. How much more can you get on rent if you're in a, uh, a good school district versus not? it doesn't it the the values go up more than the rent does so yeah. then the it doesn't cash flow anymore so like all right let's take mm -hmm. there's literally some streets in memphis where it's like this where it's like one side of the street which is the you know not in the fantastic school district you'll have a hundred thousand dollar house that rents for a thousand bucks a month across the street 
uh, or on the other side of that, that main, that main road, you'll have a $250,000 house that rents out for 1600 bucks a month. Yeah. And so then it's like, all right, I'm going to take the, this side of the street. It's still no crime. It's close to jobs. It's close to downtown. It's all these things. It just doesn't have that school district. Um, and I mean, a lot of the people that move into our, our houses, cause mostly we're doing single family homes. Most of the people that move into our houses, you know, might have young kids, but a lot of them are, are younger, I would say. And so they, you know, especially if it's like a two bedroom house, sometimes they're just living alone or living with their girlfriend or boyfriend or spouse. And, um, they don't even have kids yet. And they're just you know, looking to move into the house because it's close to their job and it's close to downtown. Oh, okay. How do you, how do you find no crime areas? So I use there truly is probably the best one that I've found to find like crime maps. Um, it's probably the most accurate one that I found that has information on all the markets that we invest in. So I use Trulia mostly for the is, crime crime map. Does, does no crime really exist? Cause I remember looking at the Trulia maps and never really thinking no crime was a, a was a thing. There was lower crime. Little. Um, so we, so little to no crime is what we look for. There is yeah. some places that, that have absolutely no crime. So like it's like a heat to, map. So you look at the heat map and you just want the, the lesser of the heat. Yeah. 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 Cause sometimes there is like, all right, so let's take a zip codes like this and then uh, you know, there might be one street that has some crime across it, but that could be because there's bars and stuff. And so kids are drunk or public intoxication. And that shows up as like, yeah. um, you know, crime or whatever, but it's because people went out or, you know, if you have like retail and it's like shoplifting and stuff and that gets reported as crime, it's not really a crime, you know, it's not like yeah. a person to person combat and stuff like that. So you're probably wanting to avoid the violent crime uh, yeah, side the violent of things. Crime. Yeah. Okay. So, so you've got your two main markets being uh, Memphis and Cleveland. Um, uh, what kind of diversity and employers are you looking for in those two cities? Like Cleveland, I know it's, it's a pretty big city still, so it's probably got a very wide range of employers. Would that be fair to yeah. say? So it has their major employer there is going to be the Cleveland clinic. So it's okay. like one of the top rated hospitals in the U S um, and then they have a, they have like 10 different S and P 500 companies downtown that are all diverse. And so that's something we look at to the diversification of the workforce, um, to make sure that all the, the major employers are in different industries. And so yeah. Cleveland, Ohio is one of those places. I think the biggest one is healthcare due to Cleveland clinic. Um, mm -hmm. but I think it's only like 20% of the entire workforce is in the healthcare industry. Yeah. What do you think about going in suburbs outside of diverse cities like that? Like just the outer, the outskirts, is that a, a profitable strategy or can you not make the numbers work? So you can definitely make the numbers work uh, a couple of things. And it depends how far out, like you're talking like two hours out or no, like, like out. 30 minutes out or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. No. So we do those all the time. Um, it, it's going to depend though on property management company is probably the biggest thing. So does the property management company manage there, depending on how big the city we're talking, right? So, um, cause sometimes in some of these markets, like, you know, Memphis, Tennessee, 30 minutes out can get you really, can get you really far out of the city. Um, yeah. so does property management company manage there? Is there a demand for rentals there? And then is it close to jobs as well? And sometimes those, mm -hmm those jobs like the trucking companies or, you know, the blue collar jobs are 30 minutes outside of the city. And so, you know, you can be right next to an Amazon warehouse, which is, you know, 30 minutes outside of the city or Memphis international airport, which is 20 minutes outside of downtown. And so those are great places to invest still because you are close to the jobs, but do I want to be like 30 minutes away from jobs and downtown and the school system? You know, maybe not. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. As far as rent rules and, you know, landlord being landlord friendly versus tenant friendly, would you say Ohio in general is more landlord friendly or tenant friendly? Both of them, I would say are uh, more landlord friendly. Okay. Um, it's been pretty, I mean, pre COVID to talk about has been like, you know, 30 day, you know, 20, 21 to 30 day evictions to get tenants out of the properties that don't file for bankruptcy. If they file bankruptcy, then it's mostly, you know, 45 days to get a tenant out. Can you evict now? We can evict now. Um, it can't be for non-payment. 
It can be for, so you can't evict somebody due to non-payment if they have lost their job due to COVID and there's these other rules and speculations. Also, if you have a Fannie Mae mortgage, you cannot evict, which when we own our properties, we uh, own them all cash. Therefore, we are not abiding by a government-backed security or mortgage. So we can't evict. We can't evict for non-payment, though, if the tenant lost their job due to COVID or had some COVID distress. Um but all the tenants that we have in eviction right now or we're giving them cash for keys have not lost their jobs due to COVID. They just don't want to pay and they're trying to get out of the system or get through the system. So, yeah, that's a, that's a good conversation to have. Um, like how many are you seeing? Cause I, I'm assuming you keep some tabs with the people you sell properties to. Um, right. Like what are you hearing back from your property managers in terms of the base of, of, uh, or the pool of, of properties yeah, and yeah. how many aren't paying? Yeah. So, the properties I'm talking about right now are properties that we bought, yeah. we inherited a tenant and we're getting that tenant out before yeah. we put in a new tenant to sell it. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So all the ones that we have evictions going on, which is probably like 10 to 15 evictions that we have going on, all of those tenants are our tenants. So nobody, I want to resolve the situation, get them out, clean up the house. They can stay if they're willing to sign a new lease and pay new rent. I don't want people to think I'm like going in there and, breaking down doors. Um, but you know, some of these tenants sign new leases, the other ones we evict them or we give them a thousand dollars to go move out and find a new place to live and give them a bunch of places to where they can go and live. Um, and then we, uh, so we have, yeah, 10 to 15 evictions going on after we sell the properties. Most of these, um, we're having like a, what, a, about a 1% eviction rate for our clients. So even even the throughout the lockdown, all this, uh, you yeah, know, even throughout the lockdown. Okay. Yep, it's still been right around a 1% eviction rate. Eviction. And so anybody who's in non-payment is getting evicted. Like I'd hate to be one of those landlords. That's uh, don't worry about that. It's just, it'll keep going. Okay, I'd hate good. to be one worried. of those. <laughs> I'd hate to be one of those landlords. That's not getting paid because uh, somebody lost their job uh, as a tenant. And that's, yes. so that's a reality. So if I was one of the guys that, you know, was supposed to be collecting a thousand dollars a month, I'm not getting that anymore. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Except if they prove to us that they lost their job due to COVID, right? And so, hey, landlord, I lost my job due to COVID. Here's the paperwork to prove it, that I lost my job or else furloughed or whatever. First of all, a lot of these people were getting the the money from the government. They were getting like a thousand bucks a week or 600 bucks a week um, from the unemployment because they had lost their job due to COVID. So people were kind of covered. And then on top of that, there was also these like <sighs> Cuyahoga County and Shelby County. So Memphis and Cleveland both started these like economic programs for people that lost their jobs due to COVID. And they were actually paying people people's rent if they would fill out a form and provide documentation that they did lose their job to COVID. So pretty much every tenant that would come to us was getting paid through the unemployment if they did lose their job. And if they got fired or whatever the case may be, then we were connecting them with these um, these funds that were paying for tenants rents so that people wouldn't skip a payment. And so that worked for a lot of the cases. I'm assuming there still is probably a few of our clients that, you know, are in eviction and they're waiting to get the tenants out. But that's, that's helped us even personally with a couple of the properties that we had where the city actually stepped up and started paying the rent for the tenant until they went and got another job. Like you could still hold these tenants liable for these amounts, even if they're not paying yeah. now, right? Because they're just going to have to make it up later, right? Yep. Yep. And they were all makeups. So yeah, you can't, you can go pretty much once, once the COVID ban is lifted and courts are, courts are open, you can go to court and be like, Hey, Susie owes me $6,500, you know, for, for rent. And so it is all due after it's not like lost. And yeah. I think, yeah, a lot of people are just reading the headlines and not reading the fine print um, for these things. Well, I'm, I'm wondering, so can you, I mean, it, I guess it depends on the quality of your, your application for rental, but if you have their bank account, if you know where they bank, can you get a judgment and then like garnish their wages, take it from their bank account? Like, are, are those things possible? I think that you still have to go through the court. Oh yeah, system. of course you got to get a judgment, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's what you mean. So yeah. I don't know what, what, I don't <laughs> you know. You don't go that far. <laughs> I don't know about that part. Like we can do we, that in Ontario. You, you can do that. Like we're uh, really, it's really land uh, tenant friendly, but you can, you can actually seek damages through the court. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. I don't know. It's going to be an interesting time because again, normally these things are like $400, have a lawyer go, 
you get a move out date, which is in like two weeks and then boom, tenants are out. You're like, you never had to really yeah. deal with this kind of stuff. Now it's completely different. We're like, some tenants owe us like on the apartment buildings that we just sold, they owed us like $3,500. And we were like, all right, you're going to pay this. We're taking you to court, but the court date's like a month and a half out because yeah. everything's delayed. And then, Hey, we'll offer you cash for keys. Forget about the court date. Okay. And then they would take it and go move yeah. out. And we would just kind of, so. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense know. that you got, you got to pick your battles. And I think the big exactly. difference is in Ontario, like there are professional tenants that know how to work the system and they might be in a, in a unit for an entire year without paying. Oh so those people, <laughs> and they're so yeah. slippery, they'll lie on their applications and they'll, you know, they'll find ways around it, but the average tenant isn't that smart. So yeah, if you tell them, look, like they just think they can stop paying rent. You, you tell them, look, I, you know, eventually you're going to have to pay this. I don't want to have to come garnish your wages, you know, take it from your bank account, you know, register it with your employer. I don't want to do any of that. Why don't we just work this out? And yeah. uh, that's kind of the approach I would take with it, which is what, you know, cash for keys. That's where that kind of thing comes from. Oh, you're yeah. not working right now. You can't afford to pay. Like, why don't I just give you a little bit of cash and you just scramble and exactly. uh, you know, maybe for a lot of them, that's worth it. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And I think even yesterday too, it, I think the CDC extended the eviction moratorium. And then like, I don't know how much later today, this morning, we got an email from one of our property management companies that says in light of the CDC, you know, the CDC is whatever, extending the eviction moratorium, but we don't think we don't agree with it. And we don't think that it's whatever lawful or has legs mm -hmm. to stand on that kind of thing. We've had our lawyers look at it and blah, blah, blah. And then somebody, even in the, the mayor of, Cleveland or um, somebody, somebody in Ohio said a similar thing, like, Hey, courts are still open. Screw this CDC eviction moratorium thing. Like yeah. go on, go on eviction, evicting tenants for non-payment. So this is all like brand new in the last 24 hours. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens because I don't know if the state of Ohio says, Oh no, evictions are open, but there's a federal eviction moratorium. I don't know. It's going to be interesting. The, the interesting note about the U S in general is like, there's so many layers of the legal system <laughs> and so many yeah. that seem to contradict each other. Like, yep. like right in the constitution, there are things that contradicts codes and acts that they create. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's pretty yep. tough to navigate well, through all this stuff. Well, it was weird because when this first all happened, I mean, the CDC who is not even a federal organization, yeah. how can they do a moratorium on, on rent? Exactly. Rents? Exactly. And then, so right from the beginning, everybody was kind of like, this is complete bullshit. How can they even do this? They're not even a federal, you know, a government mm -hmm. agency. They're just a center for disease control. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, I mean, people just kind of like followed along. It's, it felt like because the courts were closed. So they were like, there was no way for them to really fight it. Um, but now with a lot of the COVID cases, you know, going down and courts reopening, I mean, LA opened up like uh, to the orange tier today, which means even more indoor seating and that kind of thing. And so with the courts opening up, it's going to be, it's going to be really interesting to see what the Ohio mm -hmm. courts do and if they can just do their own, do their own thing without regard to the, the federal eviction moratorium by a non-government agency. Yeah. I think, uh, I think there probably is a way, but it's going to take a crafty approach. So yep. yeah, it's interesting to know. So why don't we get into a little bit of a case study here of uh, like a property, like what you think you can find, what you can, what you can sort of offer as an end product. Um, okay. In your, in your the company. End product so, side. Yeah. On the end product side, we, we can talk about like a, a flip for you and you know what that looks like as well. But I, I'd love to hear kind of like the end product side, what it, what it would look like uh, offering sure. it to somebody. Sure. So let's take a hundred thousand dollar property. Okay. Rents out for a thousand bucks a month. Uh, you can still find that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We can still find that. And that would be right in Cleveland or that would be in Tennessee. Let's just say it's in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. So what would the uh, taxes look like on a place like that? Ooh, boy, let's put like 2000 bucks a year. Okay. Uh, insurance for a building like that. Um, 700 bucks a year. Okay. And, um, maintenance wise like i especially in that price point like are these pretty well done like what's been done by the time they're you sell well it? done but they're going to be old so i would budget like i normally budget five percent for vacancy five percent for maintenance okay so i'll throw a five percent vacancy in there that's only 600 bucks though i mean you could spend that in paint 
<laughs> that's yeah. that's the thing. I like to put that in perspective. So I'll just throw in a 10% for now. But sure. um, do you have, I know in Ohio, the water, the water bill, if the tenants don't pay it, sticks with the landlord. Um, you know, just a little miscellaneous stuff like that. So How it sticks with the up? landlord, but we charge back the tenant after. Oh, really? So you just go after the tenant for it? Yeah. Usually get it? Yeah. Okay. You got to have a good system for that. So we'll it's a that basis out. for eviction if they do not pay for it. And can you just inquire with the city? Is it paid directly to the city? So the water department, I believe is like a private entity. Okay. I don't think it's a government agency. It's probably a sub agency of some, some level. Yeah. Of something. Yeah. yeah. I'm not so sure, but I, I remember like, um, the landlords pay for the utilities, but then we charge back the tenant mm -hmm. factor and in the lease that they signed with us, it says that they will pay us back for all the utilities. Da, 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 da. If they are not paid, then, you know, we can take you to court and you know have legal action or right. evict you on the basis of that. So you will have some pretty good information on your tenant. So you can track them after they leave the, the property, if they go somewhere yes. else. Okay. Yep. Um, okay. So management wise, what are you, what are you paying? 10% uh, of collected rents. 10%. So that'd be uh that'd be 1200 a year. And then uh, I'm guessing the tenant just takes care of all snow shoveling, lawn cutting. Yep. All, that. all utilities too. Yep. Do you have any issue with that ever? Like, do they ever just not do it or are they generally pretty good? So if they do not do it, then the city comes and does it. And then when the city comes and does it, we get the bill and we charge the tenant. Okay. So they, they don't get a way to weasel out of that. Nope. Okay. It has to be done. Okay. So that would be, um, so I got 2000 for taxes, 700 for insurance. I have maintenance 1200. I've got management 1200 and 500 bucks for miscellaneous. I'm being trying to be conservative here. Yep. Um, anything else you would throw in there? Taxes, insurance, property management, debt service. Yeah. We're going to get to that. So yeah, no, that's it. That's okay. So, so we've got, um, I'm seeing a cap rate of about 5.8. It's not too bad. Um, as far as mortgages go, it, it would depend on who's, who's trying to get the mortgage, but can you get a, what's the limit for mortgages? Cause you need to have at least a $70,000 loan value typically, or $75,000 loan value for a bank to so, look at it. Uh, our banks have no loan minimums. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they're getting 80% loan to value. 80%. So something like this, you'd be 80, um, 30 year amortization. And are you able to get best in market 4%. rates? 4%? 4%. Okay. Yep. So if that was a Canadian, we'd probably have to add on a couple of points um, yep. for that. So if it was uh, the average buyer in American buying it, they're probably going to be around a hundred bucks on, on their cash flow, is what I'm seeing here. Maybe a touch more. And of course, they're getting yep. principal pay down and, and some other benefits there. Uh, yeah. If, if it was a Canadian buyer, you might be more of a break even. If you're at a six percent, <laughs> you're going to be like seven dollars cash flow or something like that. We've been pretty yeah. conservative in these numbers, so hopefully that's all. Uh, yeah. You know, that's all. Yeah. Hopefully you got a tenant with no maintenance. And yeah. No move out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so normally it's normally it's like it should be right around a little over a hundred bucks. So across the board over the last three hundred houses, it's normally. <clears throat> 200 to $300 a month in net cash flow without the holdbacks, maintenance, vacancy, capex. Mm -hmm. So two to $300 a month. Yeah. With the holdbacks, it should be like a hundred to $150, depending on of course what people right. do. I do 5% and 5%. And then I don't do any like miscellaneous. I just do 5% vacancy, 5% maintenance. Um, and then that should get you, yeah, like 150, maybe a little bit less than 150. Yeah. So down the road, if rents go up there, you know, you're going to, you're going to start to yeah, see yeah. that cash flow expand and, yep. uh, which would be okay. All right. So that's the typical sort of offering that you can, uh, that you can make. Now, what's it look like for you? Like what kind of opportunity is in it for you? Like, are you able to get that product that after reno, like, cause we obviously look at that as a burr, right? Even if you're selling it, I guess you're flipping it. Right. But you know, say you wanted to do that as a burr. If, yeah. if you wanted to get something that was worth a hundred K when it's done uh, after it's renovated, what are you having to buy that for in those different markets? Yes. Yeah, so you probably would buy it for like 60 mm -hmm. renovated for like 20 to 25. So six. Yeah. And then like 5,000 bucks in other expenses, the closing costs when you bought it, <clears throat> holding costs, 
yeah. then you're probably going to have, if you're doing a refinance, you're probably going to have some refinancing costs. And that's all like hoping that the property appraises as well, which is the biggest right. risk with doing that burr side. Whereas if you're selling it, it's a lot easier for the appraiser to support it because they yeah. have a sale to support yeah. it. Yeah. And also like we, whenever the appraisals come in low, we always drop the appraisal, the sales price down to the appraised value too. So it's something a lot of the companies don't do in this space. Mm-hmm. That's a smart idea. Yeah. Is there like, what would like someone like myself, like I'm not going to jump out of bed for a hundred bucks. Like it's obviously a great way to protect your, your wealth though. Like when you're putting your, your money into an asset, when we hit this massive inflation bubble that's coming, yeah. uh, you know, I really do expect that we're going to see that. Like, I want to get my money into real estate. I want to get it working ideally with more cash flow, but you know, at very least in, in a situation where it's definitely going to take care of itself and I'm not going to be feeding money into it. Yeah. Um, so that's ideal, but is there a way or is there a ter- certain type of property that, that you can do better than that? Um, maybe buying in higher volumes of units, I guess I'm just looking, is there a further opportunity beyond that? Yeah. There, I mean, that's, was just like a super simple deal. There obviously are deals that hit our website all the time, but mm-hmm. okay, let me see. Yeah. There's, there is deals that hit our website all the time that are a little bit different. I mean, <clears throat> For example, like those taxes in Cleveland, Ohio are really expensive. Mm -hmm. So like there's a property in Memphis, Tennessee that, you know, the same house, let me see, $90,000, but the taxes, instead of 2000 bucks a month, they are, uh, 900 bucks a month. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's half the taxes, which goes right into your pocket, blah, blah, Mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. So yes, to, to answer your question there, there is, and we also sometimes get duplexes as well, which have higher, higher cash flow and have bigger numbers. Um, the purchase prices are bigger, the cash flow is bigger, but then also the maintenance for duplexes, you know, I would put, you know, even more cash into those duplexes in terms of maintenance and, and vacancy yeah. and stuff like that. So, so the tenants don't um, take as good a care of them. Does it attract yeah. a worse, like a, a notably worse tenant for a duplex? Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Do you try and stay away from that then? <laughs> we, <sighs> they still are really good properties to hold um, just because probably the vacancy side of things, you're, you'll always at least have one tenant, at least in their paying rent. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just like the tenant is way more transient. So I try to not sell them to like new clients who are doing their first real estate investment, like the single family homes in the suburbs with a family living there for three, four, five years straight is like the epitome of turnkey and the best way to go duplex now you have like you're going to be closer to downtown or you're going to be in some core city because they don't build duplexes out in the suburbs um they didn't do that in the 60s and 70s um so now you're going to be a little bit closer to downtown or in like a mid-city kind of area and then those tenants are going to be younger you know transient they may stay their you know their their full year term if you're lucky or they they probably are just going to move out not in nine months is the i think nine months to a year is the average length of stay for a duplex, whereas a single family home, it's two years Um, and way more transient. Don't take care of their stuff. And I mean, you have to think about it too. Like the duplexes are also much older. Like they're built in 1910, 1920s, where the Mm -hmm. single families, 1960s and seventies. So you have these old brick duplexes that are huge, like about, you know, 2000 square feet. Um, and you have all these major systems in the basement with you know two furnaces, two hot water tanks, two HVAC units. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot more like stuff that can go wrong. So normally we save those and sell those to people who like, uh, you know, know what they're doing and they're not going to worry about like something happening every month in terms of like a maintenance yeah. item. <laughs> there's going to, there's going to be a fair number of them. Like, I just know with older properties, cause I've, I got my own construction company back home and I've managed my own properties and I've, I've, I know what the, the renovated ones look like in terms of maintenance yeah. and what the unrenovated yeah. ones like. and the unrenovated ones have been a pain in the butt. Yeah. Um, so what kind of renos do you get into typically? Is it mostly just cosmetic or are you going in, if there's knob and tube, are you removing the knob and tube and, and putting in uh, new wiring? So, Knob and tube um, was typical in Cleveland, Ohio. We leave the knob and tube typically um, because our ins- our insurance company will still provide insurance for the knob and tube wiring. So mm-hmm. knob and tube is fine. We also have like city inspectors that come out and verify everything. And so mm-hmm. the city is fine with it. They give it a, a certification to rent out the property. 
and the insurance company is fine. Until that yeah. changes, then we will like have to go in and do it, which we're fine with, but nobody's like beating down our door to yeah place the novel well, tube. Usually if you put the the GFCIs on the circuits, I think yeah, they're okay so with them. That. Yeah. Yeah. And so we do do that. And then um so we do do that normally. The GFCI is required. Um, so we, we replace all of those outlets with GFCIs. Um, in terms of the renovations, uh, we do do cosmetics and I try to like, I like to try to do a couple of like big ticket items, like major CapEx items as well. So like a roof or a furnace or the hot water tank and HVAC, or I like to do like some of those things for the client to make sure that they, you know, have at least one mm -hmm. or two or three of these items that are going to be you know, fine for the next five, 10, 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. so I would say, yes, we do cosmetic renovate the kitchens and bathrooms, but also I like to handle some of the big CapEx items that could be haunting, um, the, the landlord. Nice. Now, is there, is there another market that you're looking at now, or are you happy with these markets? I got to assume that since Memphis is, uh, is heating up, like you said, I think the same way I'm, I'm like, okay, time to look elsewhere. Exactly. So where, what are some other ones that are on your radar? Um, even if you're non-committal at the moment, what are some, some uh, places you're looking at? Yeah. So Detroit would be the newest place we're looking at, mm -hmm. which I never thought I would say. I never thought you would say that either. <laughs> right. Um, I don't live that far from Detroit, you know, three hours. I know. Yeah. I know. Also when I go to London, I fly into Detroit and then I drive yeah. to London. Um, and so Detroit, uh, is the new place we're looking at. We have two houses under contract. I have a pretty good team. My uncle used to flip houses, not the one that connected us, another one. Mm -hmm. And he's a real, real uncle this time. Um, but he, uh, used to flip houses there. So he knew some people, he was telling me some good things about it, which I said, yeah, right. And then I started doing more and more research on the market to see if it could find the stuff in my criteria. So like little to no crime close to jobs. Um, and then 15 to 20 or 15 to 30 minutes from downtown. Right. And I actually did some research on my biggest zip codes in Memphis and Cleveland and started looking at some statistics like the average sale price, average rent, rent to value ratio. Um, then looked at crime and close to jobs and all that kind of stuff. And I think, with that data that we had found in Memphis and in Cleveland, there was like four to five zip codes each. And then I did like a whole analysis on every other zip code and Youngstown came up a ton of times until I did some research. I think Youngstown was like 10 to 15 times that Youngstown appeared to have like zip codes with little to no crime, amazing rent to value ratios, 15, 20 minutes to downtown, that kind of thing. And I was like, okay, Youngstown seems interesting until I started doing more research and um, the, the, I don't know, maybe something was wrong with the crime map I was using, but it was like way worse than what I thought. So that showed up. And but it then, depends on where, it, it depends on where, because I know it's a, it's a city of pockets. There's just like a lot of like yeah. small pockets that are fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That could be the case. Um, except then I talked to my team in Cleveland, Ohio, who knew some people in Youngstown and I told him, Hey, you want to expand to Youngstown? And he said, I'm never, ever going <laughs> to like, I won't even go there for you. Yeah. Um, so I was like, all right, well that ends that. And then I looked at Detroit and then I had a call with my uncle about Detroit. Detroit showed up 20 times, 20 times compared to like the three to five in Memphis, the three to five in Cleveland. And I was like, Oh my God, this is insane it was the number one city i think it was cleveland youngstown and then you had st louis memphis cleveland. but what were you searching this on like what system were you doing the search on like i pulled raw data from the bureau of labor statistics okay about the zip codes the population um and then then kind of had a bunch of people go through that and then find the zip code and find the median sales price for that zip code the median rent and then was running calculations on that and then had somebody go and check that against the crime map. And then we would flag all the zip codes that hit all three or four or five of those kind of key metrics. Nice. Okay. So you so see, you've got your system uh, mapped out for how to figure this out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Detroit came up on first of the list and I talked to my uncle about it. He, he, you know, gave it the, the thumbs up or whatever. 
And then I started reaching out to people. I found a couple of good teams and now we're testing one team and have a couple deals under contract and we'll see how it goes. Uh, the worst thing is I, I, uh, get to keep two houses in D- Detroit, Michigan. Yeah. I mean, that could, it's not the end of the world. Like I know a guy that actually flips a bunch in, uh, in Detroit and, uh, he likes, you know, getting into some of those older, you know, character type homes, yeah. um, not far from There's downtown. Yeah. Really nice yep. places. And he'll do them up nice and sell them and make a good margin. Um, he flips a ton of properties there. Uh, Canadian guy. Um, nice. so I guess I, I'm curious what your numbers look like there. I mean, how much different are they? Are you getting 1% rule or are you getting a better than 1% rule in that market? Let me see. I have one pulled up right here. This one is, uh, <clears throat> ARV 110,000 bucks. Rent is 1100 bucks right at the 1% rule. So stick taxes. Oh my God. Listen to this taxes, 2000 insurance, 700. Exactly so it's pretty it much the same thing. Pretty much yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Uh, which, which, which is surprising to me. It, it seems like now things have kind of evened out across a lot of different markets. Like I'm not finding any obvious markets where you're blowing the yeah. 1% rule out of the water, which is really weird to me. Uh, yeah. And I think a lot of this must have been driven over the last year with all the money printing. It's just rents yeah. can't keep up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's the case. Um, except I don't know. I think you can still find it to be honest. Like if you go to like, if you go to Detroit and go to some places with like 50 to 60 K ARVs and like, yeah, you can still probably get rents for, this is rents for 1100. So you probably get like seven or $800 in rent. So yeah, you're going to beat the 1% rule. Are you going to be at 2%? Hell no, but you'll be at 1.2 or 1.3% instead. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think it's definitely possible. It's just, yeah, I just don't think it's, it's just a place that I've never liked to, invest i learned very early on that uh you know you want to stay out of those low arv places which would be like 60k or 70k and below yeah i i I hear you and i you just don't want to attract that certain clientele like everything i've done as an investor after the ohio experience has has been for me at youngstown has always been about creating a product that i would live in myself yeah and and something that i would have liked because then um, i avoid a certain type of clientele i don't want to deal with and I stick yep. with the reasonable people. I like to get reasonable tenants. So yep. Yep. that's kind of, kind of what goes through my head. Any parting words of wisdom for investors, people kind of thinking of, you know, getting into one of these towns, like what would you recommend to somebody? Cause you've obviously, you know, you've, you've worked really quickly. You've, you've built a really good business around this. You obviously know your stuff. Like what, what are your big takeaways? The biggest thing about like, uh, I haven't had a call with one of my friends that I play soccer with yesterday and uh he he works full time he works from six in the morning to like six or seven p.m at night so 12 hour days he's out driving around not on a computer installing fire alarms and fire systems and stuff and Mm -hmm. my biggest word of advice to him and to everybody listening would be to match the resources that you have with the best strategy for you like Mm -hmm. i could tell everybody here my story and how exactly to do it and i can make a a thousand videos and write a hundred books about how i did everything i did but it doesn't mean that it's gonna help you in your current situation Mm -hmm. it's gonna be one path but you need to find somebody who was in your path and now made it and so i would just say get out there and listen to as many people as you possibly can listen to you know all these episodes on this podcast and every other podcast to go, you know, find and listen to a thousand different stories about a hundred, how a thousand different people did it or made it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think then you're going to be able to find the right path for you. And, um, looking back, that's something that I did, you know, unconsciously while I was in college, I was taking people to coffee and I was on like, I went to probably like 200, 300 coffee meetings with people in and around LA Um, and I was just like using the card as, Hey, I'm a young college kid. I want to invest in real estate. Can I take you to a coffee Mm -hmm. and let's like pick your brain? Yeah, sure. And so took all that information and finally was like, all right, this is the path for me. This is how I'm going to do it. And so match the resources that you have with the strategy that makes the most amount of sense and get out there and just listen to as many stories about people who, you know, are where you want to be. And finally, you'll eventually you'll find the, uh, the right path for you. Yeah. Wise words. I I definitely agree. I mean, it's sometimes it's hard to uh, consume all that information, but uh, yeah, Yeah. as I want to do more in the U S I'm listening to more U S based podcasts or watching more people who are, who are down there here in these markets. 
uh, Canadians that are doing it down here. Like that's all, all really important stuff. Um, yep. So where can people find you, follow you, reach you if, uh, if they want to learn more? Yeah, sure. Um, so my website's martellturnkey.com. You can go there, book a phone call with us if you're interested in that. Um, and then the best way to reach out to me personally would be on Instagram at Martel Antoine, uh, on Instagram, feel free to DM me. I post every day and you can go check out all the content there. Awesome. Well, I will get you to fire me over those links and I'll put them in the show notes. Thanks, Antoine. I really appreciate this. And I know, you know, I'm personally getting a lot out of it. I'm sure our listeners and viewers are too. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Please make sure to share this episode far and wide. Help it help more people. I really appreciate you tuning in. Thanks. I'll see you on the next one. Mm -hmm.